it and Voyager twin spacecraft um, are at the edge of the solar system moving right right out of it by now and they both analyzed the same data but what Dmitriev did was saw the progression of the X I of, of the measurements 15 years ago and he, he used his intellect to conclude that it was being caused by something that that the atmospheres of Jupiter and Saturn and Uranus and Neptune were being excited by something because they were not behaving in an irrational, um, chemically stable way. Was it a planet X? No. Well, not according to him. He thinks it's this cloud of energy. And the Nature magazine scientists waited until Voyager satellite made it all out there and reported the data that Dmitriev predicted. And, of course, they're the ones that get the global publication on this. And the Siberian scientist goes unnoticed in, in, in the United States, or, or almost, but he used his his vision to beat these guys who published in Nature by 15 years. But regardless of the horse race, I mean, I just always, I, just, I like, I like the guy who sticks out his neck and uses, you know, some creative imagination. Sure. But regardless, we now have from to the two great space scientific establishments in the world, the United States, and the West and the East, the, the, uh, confirmation that we're moving into an interstellar energy cloud. I mean, this is big news. And I and I was I remember saying to Dmitriev, you know I'm I'm kind of bummed out by this. Uh, he said, Oh, you don't need to be. And I said, Well, why not? You know, you mentioned global catastrophe. He said, Yes, but in, if you take the long view, it's fine. He said, Whenever you inject energy, extra energy into the into a system such as this interstellar energy cloud would, the system naturally gets more excited, and ultimately the organisms within that system. Uh, ascend to a higher level of organization, evolution is hastened, and, 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 and there's a, a good outcome. I said, you have to have an awfully long term to take solace out of that. I mean, I'd, you know what, I'd rather evolution just stayed in a little snail space, and I didn't, we didn't get juiced by this cloud, hmm. but what i rather is sadly irrelevant here. But um, it's, there's such momentous goings on. I mean, you think about this story. Oh yeah, we're, we're the whole the whole solar system is moving into a cloud of energy. Um, and you tell it to people, and understandably, they they kind of go tilt. Oh, they don't understand it. Yeah, and and it's also there's there's an emotional limit. I know I have it. I mean, I when when I start making jokes, whether they're good or bad, when I start just popping off jokes, it's because emotionally I am no longer capable of, of assimilating a certain amount of information, a certain set of, of facts. I make jokes. Other people shut down. Other people uh, turn on, you know, uh, top 40 hits, whatever. We all have our defense mechanisms. Sure, sure. That's what you do. And, uh, but uh, this, is, this is really astonishing, and it, it may uh, explain a lot of this as we're, we began the, the evening discussing this crescendo of catastrophes, I mean, it, it may well have to do with this. How, how much can people take when you're hit with, let's say, this golf spill, yeah. this economic mess, wars? We had a bunch of soldiers killed today. Oh. How much of this can we take? And then you add the natural disasters that are happening. I mean, these have been all man-made that I just mentioned, but what about these natural ones you add to it? How much can people take before they blow up? Or shut down. I don't know. Um, the the difference of the natural catastrophes, I, I learned something about this um, in uh, studying a EMP, electromagnetic pulse. Uh, if you read the, 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 the house bill that I was talking about, protecting the power grid, there's also um, a section about... Um, electromagnetic pulse that could come from nuclear weapons. And people have a, a, a more visceral emotional connection to a story about a human enemy. They can get angry. They can retaliate. Then they do, uh, I believe, the natural catastrophes, which, which seem amoral and random. They're not necessarily so. But you don't know who to get mad at when it's a natural catastrophe. So I think natural t catastrophes and the prospect of more of them shut people down, whereas man-made catastrophes where there's a villain or at least a, a negligent party, I'm sure I think BP is somewhere in between that, um, you, 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 you get riled up. You know, so it's, it's, uh, 
it's it's a push pull emotionally. At least that's the way it works for me. What's your take, Lawrence? In the few minutes we have left this hour, about Planet X, do you think it's out there? No, you don't. I don't. Um, I think that the the orbit that has been described for Planet X to be able to do to wreak its havoc is like doing the limbo. Um, I don't feel that 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 argument has been sustained. Um, I just have never seen an orbit like that and would be shocked if there were one. We're, we're a planet orbiting in that, in that crazy, dipsy... 3,600-year elliptical, elliptical orbit. I uh, yeah, I just think it's it's not. Uh, 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 among my worries, it isn't. So your biggest concern, as we talked about, just to review, is that we would get hit from a solar EMP blast. Absolutely, and it will knock out our power supply. Not concerned about uh, some nation setting off a nuke in the atmosphere? I am, but, you know, we have an excellent defense establishment. We have a great Air Force, and we have a great you know, intelligence agencies that have been focused for decades on preventing just sort of a, a, an attack. And I'm not saying they're foolproof, but we've erected a very elaborate set of defenses against that eventuality. We've done squat all to protect ourselves against the solar EMP blast, and uh, that's you know that's why I'm much more concerned with that. Also, just the magnitude of it. I mean, you, you know, you would have to set off some pretty mighty, huge nuclear weapons. I mean, really impossibly large nuclear weapons to mimic the effects of, of the 1859 Carrington event or the 1921 Great uh, Magnetic Storm. Well, that's true, too. And, and people think that the, come December 21st, 2012, it's going to be like a light switch. Uh, I think it's happening now. Yes, I do, too. I really do. And it, it just feels that way. And I know, you know, feeling does not prove anything. It's because I feel something. It doesn't mean it, it is. But but there's just some culmination going on here. And, well, I guess we'll talk more about that next hour. Yeah. The aftermath, is it out there in the bookstores now? Yeah, it just came out yesterday. Perfect timing. Thank you. The website, what is it? LawrenceEJoseph.com. And spell Lawrence for everyone. L-A-W-R-E-N-C-E-E-J-O-S-E-P-H. All right, and we've got that link up at coasttocoastam.com. And when we come back next hour, we will talk about his visits with shamans. Why would a journalist dealing with science visit shamans? We'll find out on Coast to Coast AM. So why would Lawrence Joseph meet with shamans? Hmm? Let's find out when we come back on Coast to Coast AM. Let's talk about your visits with shamans. How many did you find? Where did you go? Well, I, the first trip I made to work with shamans, I went down to Guatemala to work with uh, Mayan shamans um, because you know, I had read on the Internet that the ancient Maya predicted that 2012 would be such and such. And I thought, well, just because it says so on the Internet doesn't mean that it's true. So I wanted to, you know, a little boots on the ground and do some due diligence. So I, I worked with brothers uh, Carlos and Gerardo Barrios, who were trained shamans, and that was their, their profession. And they themselves had spent 20 years going around the former Mayan kingdom just trying to verify what the ancient prophecies were. Um, and to see if 2012 were uh, exaggerated in importance. I mean, maybe, you know, maybe one guy said something about 2012 and, you know, then the calendar ended. And they, they wanted to just get a handle on their own their own legacy and their own heritage. And then um, so I worked with them. And that was fascinating to me because I learned that you know, the, the shamans and the, the prophecies, rather, were based on some really great, ancient astronomy, you know, astronomy that comes with intense of a percentage points of what we can do today with telescopes and computers and spacecraft. Isn't that something? Yeah. Um, with, they didn't even have a lens. And they came, they predicted eclipses and movements, not only of the planets around the sun, but the, the solar system through the galaxy, uh, remarkably accurately, un, un, preternaturally accurately. And so I, I love to work with with folks who who uh, have a, a a passionate visceral connection to the land around them and to the sky above, even if 
their deductions are not necessarily rational or, or cannot be logically constructed, it doesn't mean they're wrong. They just, some, you know, 